Hello, SpongeGex here, and today I am going to review two straight-to-VHS and DVD movies of Mickey Mouse. The first one is Mickey's Once Upon a Christmas, and its sequel, Mickey's Twice Upon a Christmas. So these were both animated movies I grew up with when they first came out. I remember as a kid, I was excited to watch these. And so, over the years, people have shared their opinions on what they think of these. Um, it seems like most people think the first one is okay. And then when it comes to the second one, um, people don't seem to really like that one very much. And I remember as a kid, I thought Mickey's Twice Upon a Christmas was okay, though. But um, I can definitely admit the first one is a lot better. But one of the main reasons the second one is so divided is because of its visuals. Now, at the time, it was marketed as quite an achievement, though. It was the first uh, computer-animated Mickey Mouse cartoon. And so I remember at the time, it looked pretty good, though. But <laughs> that's because we had a long ways to go with computer animation back then. Because people have pointed out how that movie's the movie's visuals have not aged well at all. And, yeah, I can kind of agree. There are some segments that look all right, and then there are some that are just downright hard to watch, and, um, I'm still gonna say it, though, still better than Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. I stand by that. <laughs> so, these movies are mainly an anthology series, a collection of short stories. Um, most of them are original, but then there's one exception where it's, um, an adaption of an old story, um, uh, The Gift of the Magi, and so that was my introduction to that story, um, I didn't even realize it was based on a story, and uh, eventually I, you know, st I heard details of the original story. It's like, oh, so that's where that Mickey Mouse cartoon got it from. But so let's start off with the first one, which is arguably the better one, Mickey's Once Upon a Christmas. This came out in the late 1990s, and uh, it was a straight to VHS movie. The first story on this is Stuck on Christmas, and that is basically a careful what you wish for kind of story, where Huey, Dewey, and Louie. Uh, one night wish that uh, they could celebrate Christmas every day and then they wake up in a Groundhog Day situation where the day keeps repeating itself. So all the presents they opened last night, they're gone they're, because they're re-wrapped up. And so they have to relive the same Christmas day over and over. And at first they're enjoying it, um, but they're being very neglectful. You see how they're opening the presents before their family gets there. Uh, they're rushing to get Donald's um, gift to them without even reading the card he and Daisy made for them. And so we see how they're also rude at the dinner table and how they're ignoring Scrooge when he wants to sing Christmas carols with the family. They'd rather play with their toys. So then one morning they decide to change things up after getting really sick of everything. They decide to change the routine by misbehaving even worse than usual. So at first they think it's a good laugh until they accidentally cause... Um, Donald end up chasing a turkey in the house, which causes the whole house to get destroyed, and um, the Christmas tree falls on Donald, and so it's like they try, you know, leaving, but then they start feeling bad for Donald and bad for what they did, and then all of a sudden, they see the card that he meant to give them earlier, and they finally read it, and um, they're touched by it, and they feel bad for how they behave, and they start realizing that they've been treating Christmas all wrong. It's about family, not about the gifts and all that. And so they promise the next morning that they're going to finally, um, you know, behave themselves. And I got to admit, when I was a kid, I cried during this part. <laughs> I don't know why. I just thought it was sad, but it wasn't that bad this time though. But so the next morning, uh, they make Donald breakfast and he's confused over how they're just behaving so differently all of a sudden. And so, Eventually, he wants them to confess what they're up to, and then they reveal that they've been building a gift for him, so they built him a dream boat, and um, then the family has, like, a good Christmas, and yeah, pretty much. So, yeah, pretty good moral for kids, teaching them not only, you know, to respect that Christmas only comes once a year, but also encouraging them to, you know, treat people better around Christmas, and not be so selfish, and care about family, respect family. That's a pretty important lesson, especially nowadays when we have COVID-19, which makes us less accessible to our families. So yeah. <laughs> so the next skit is basically what would have been a Christmas special for Goof Troop, I guess, because come to think of it, out of all the Disney afternoon cartoons that had Christmas specials, 
Goof Troop wasn't one of them, but so they decided to make one for this skit, basically. So, so the story begins with Goofy and Max trying to write a letter to Santa, but they're late to deliver it to the postman, so... Max um, rides his bike over while Goofy's in tow, but um, he accidentally loses Goofy while trying to take a shortcut at the mall. So Goofy tells Max to try to stall the mailman while he catches up and reclaims the letter he dropped. And so we get a silly chase sequence of Goofy running around the mall trying to get the letter back until he finally gets it and delivers it back to the postman. Later that night, we see Max and Goofy shoveling their lawn, and Max expresses how what he really wants for Christmas is some fancy snowboard. I'm not even going to bother trying to repeat the way he described it. It's even more ridiculous than the rifle that Ralphie wanted in a Christmas story. My God. <laughs> then, of course, they're interrupted by their neighbor, Pete. And is it just me, or does he look really weird in this short... They made him look gray for some reason, so it makes him look older than he should be. And, I mean, you could argue he looked younger in a Goofy movie, and this is obviously, this obviously takes place before a Goofy movie, but Pete is making fun of Goofy because he still believes in Santa Claus. So after that, Max starts questioning if there even is a Santa Claus. Pete starts filling his head with doubts, and... So, yeah, I'll admit, like, when I was a kid, when I first watched this, this even made me start questioning if there even is a Santa and, um, because, yeah, I still had the age range where I still thought Santa existed, and so, yeah, um, I'll admit, like, this raised some questions for me, like, despite how Pete's supposed to be the bad guy in this, it's like, he made good points, though, how impossible it all sounds, but, of course, this is a kid's movie, so they have to make it where Pete's the bad guy, and, uh, so you're supposed to root for both Goofy and Mac, so, um, Goofy tries assuring Max that there is a Santa throughout, and I noticed during a part where he is decorating the tree, he pulls out an ornament of the angel from the Beauty and the Beast Christmas movie. And <laughs> Strange. But, and then if you pause right during the part where Goofy's getting electrocuted while plugging in the tree lights, it's like, you can tell the animators had a blast doing this scene. Some of these images are just bizarre. So, um... Eventually, later that night, Goofy decides to try to teach Max the importance of helping those less fortunate. And so they go over to one of their neighbors, who are kind of out of their luck at the moment. Um, they don't explain why, though, but you can tell that, um, you know, things have been tough for, like, this husband and wife. And Goofy just wanted to go over there and support his neighbor. So he made a fancy dinner for them, and he just he decided to try to surprise their kids by dressing up as Santa Claus. And... So Max is convinced that that is the real Santa Claus, and um, he sits down, tells him what he wants. But of course, one of the kids accidentally unhoods Goofy, revealing that it's actually him and not the real Santa, and Max takes it pretty hard. And so Goofy is then trying to prove to Max that Santa does exist, and uh, I just couldn't help but laugh at the face that Max makes during this part when... Goofy tries cheering him up by bringing out an old stuffed bear that um, is claimed to have been given to him by Santa, and he tries cheering him up uh, by singing Santa Claus is Coming to Town. And, I don't know, I just love the face Max makes here. <laughs> uh, so eventually, Goofy is so desperate to try to cheer Max up that he really wants to prove that Santa exists. So even if he has to stay on the roof all night um, and try to get Santa's attention and get photographic proof of him. So he's out there all night, we then get this really funny part where they think they see Santa on Pete's roof, but it turns out to be a burglar, and he gets um, arrested by the police. It's pretty funny. Meanwhile, Goofy accidentally falls off the roof, and he gives up. He he admits that Max is right. There is no Santa. And so then the tables have turned. All of a sudden, Max, it's like he's gotten over it. It's like he doesn't care that there's no Santa Claus. He still wants to celebrate Christmas with his dad regardless, but... Goofy is a little bummed out now, so the tables have turned. So Max decides to try to cheer him up by disguising as Santa Claus himself, and Goofy actually falls for it. But um, when Goofy wants to try to bring Max out to um, prove that Santa exists, um, you know, Max quickly rushes off, and so eventually Goofy's able to figure out that it is actually Max in disguise, and Max reveals he was just trying to cheer him up, and Goofy, you know, was just um, touched that he tried to go through so much trouble just to cheer him up. And But then, of course, right at the right moment, the real Santa Claus shows up magically, gives them their gifts, and gives Pete um, a pretty funny punishment um, in regards to how much of a jerk he's been throughout this special. And um, 
So then uh, after Max gets his snowboard, he decides the first thing he's going to do with it is share it with the neighbor next door, and that's it. So yeah, that was a pretty good short. Um, like a, a little generic, but um, it got the job done. Still a pretty good, you know, story for kids. So the last one, The Gift of the Magi. So this is based on an old book, and I'm sure a lot of you already know this story where a man and a woman, well, a man is desperate to get a present for his girlfriend, and um, she wants to get something special for him in return, but they're down on their luck. So in the end, they end up trading what, they end up trading their most valuable possession in exchange for each other. But so when they open their gifts, they're gifted with something that was supposed to go with their prized possession, but they realize they traded it for the one they loved. And so, but they're okay with that. They realize they gave up um, something important to them for someone who's more important in exchange. And so, yeah, it's basically that the retelling of that story, but with Mickey and Minnie. So in this version of the story, Mickey has a prized harmonica that he just loves to play. And meanwhile, Minnie has a golden watch and... Mickey thinks um, she deserves a chain so she can wear it around her neck. Uh, meanwhile, Minnie thinks that uh, Mickey should get a case for his. And so, I'll admit, when I was a kid, I was not catching on. I did not catch on to what was going to happen at the end. So, it was a pretty big surprise for me. But it's like, yeah, you watch it now, it's very predictable. But, uh, I mean, even if you've never seen this story before, you could probably figure out what's going to happen. But for little kids, they might be surprised by this. And. So yeah, it's like this story is mostly shown through the perspective of Mickey. You already know what Mickey is planning on buying Minnie, but they don't actually bother showing what Minnie wants to buy in exchange. Um, but meanwhile, it does cut back to her occasionally. We see how she's actually having financial troubles. It's like, yeah, I never thought I'd see that in a Mickey Mouse cartoon. Minnie in debt, basically, not able to afford a gift for Mickey. And so um, she's relying on a Christmas bonus at her job to pay for Mickey's gift. Um, unfortunately, her gift was just, her bonus was basically just a fruitcake, and yeah. <laughs> so, meanwhile, Mickey, he's working at um, a Christmas tree lot run by Pete, and okay, this time Pete actually looks right. Um, they got his design right here, but then Daisy, she looks a little off in this skit. Um, something about her having blue eyes, it just looks weird, but... Um, so yeah, Mickey's working at a tree lot. He's supposed to sell Christmas trees, but um, so he's just doing his best to make sure that every tree, um, you know, gets a home for an affordable price. But Pete's more focused on trying to sell the big ten footers. So Mickey eventually sees Pete trying to scam a poor family out of a, a tree they can't afford. Um, he's trying to tempt them to um, make down payments on it and. But uh, Pete, you know, tells him that this one 10-foot tree is the only one they have um, for sale. All the others are reserved. But Mickey decides to step in and say he found a smaller tree in the back, and it's more affordable, and it's not reserved. So this angers Pete, and he fires Mickey and takes money that Mickey got from an old lady for helping her out earlier. And don't feel too bad for Mickey, though, because Pete gets a good punishment right afterwards, and it was his own doing. So, um... He had a cigar, and it lit in the back of his pocket, which caused the whole lot to get caught on fire. So, his whole lot got burned down. And, yeah, I noticed this is the last time I recall seeing Pete smoking a cigar. Because, in a lot of the old Disney cartoons, you would see Pete smoking a cigar. And, uh, I mean, this still has a G rating, even. And so, this was the last time they ever portrayed Pete as a smoker. And after that, apparently, censors got more strict and... Yep, that's the last you ever saw of it, and I don't know, I, I kind of miss that, though. There's something threatening about seeing Pete where, well, there's something threatening about seeing Pete smoking a cigar, and you just don't see that anymore, and I think they still should do it, though, because it's a good message. Um, uh, What I mean by that is, you know, don't be like Pete. He's a smoker. He's a bad man. Don't do that. So I think it's important to show villains, you know, doing dangerous things like that to try to encourage people not to do it, and... I'll admit they did a good job here, though. They showed that he was smoking, and it caused his whole lot to get burned down because he was reckless. And it's like, fair, fair enough. At least the last time he ever smoked was a cautionary tale. <laughs> so we are given a bit of a detour in this short. Um, like, we cut to, like, a toy drive, and we were supposed to have these performers who were actually part of the fire department, and they were supposed to perform, but 
because of Pete's fire incident, they had to go down and take care of it. So now this toy drive had no band to play in. So I remember as a kid, I didn't really care for this scene that much. But I'll admit, looking back on it now, though, after getting a little more Disney history, there's actually some clever retro Disney references in here, though, um, that Disney enthusiasts would definitely get a kick out of. And so the band here, the Firehouse Five, that is inspired by... Obviously, that's a joke of the actual band that Walt Disney's animators were a part of. Some of Disney's um, animators were part of a band called the Firehouse Five, and I thought that was actually a clever little reference. I'll admit, I did not catch that. Um, this is my first time actually catching that when I watched this again. And it's like, oh, okay. And um, I also noticed they recycled some animation from uh, Mickey's Birthday Party, where the scene where he did that crazy dance, and... So I kind of liked how they snuck a little bit of that in there. And um, so, yeah, Mickey gets dragged into it because uh, they had no one to perform. And they saw him playing his harmonica. So they desperately begged him to play for the sake of the kids and all that. And so Mickey gives in and does it. But afterwards, he looks at the time and realizes he doesn't have enough time to get money for um, Minnie's gift. But he realizes he can still sell his harmonica because um, it's gold. And so he thinks it must be worth something. It must be worth something. And so he races off to sell his harmonica, but right when he gets there, of course, the store is closed. He begs the store owner to consider buying it off of him, but the store owner refuses and says it doesn't seem to be worth much. But So Mickey sadly sits down and starts playing his harmonica, but then the, the store owner has a change of heart and decides to buy it anyways. And uh, so then, of course, uh, the scene reveals where they exchange their gifts and... Mickey opens up his gift, and he sees it's a case, but he realizes he sold his harmonica. And then same with Minnie. She opens hers and sees the um, the chain for her watch, but realizes she sold her watch. And both of them are touched that they gave up something important for each other. And so, yeah, very heartwarming message about how the people we love are more important than prized possessions. And so the movie ends with um, basically a medley of different Christmas tunes that are played throughout these shorts, and we see each character representing a certain song until they join in together and sing them all at once for some strange reason. And So Mickey's Once Upon a Christmas, it's a pretty good film for kids. Um, it, I can definitely see it entertaining kids more than adults, but adults who have like fond memories of Mickey Mouse might get a kick out of it. There might be some little references or stuff that might make them smile or there might be a few jokes that might make you laugh but overall it's mostly a kid movie but it's a good one though it's a good kid movie now as for mickey's twice upon a christmas um unlike the first movie where it was a collection of three shorts this one is a collection of five shorts but oddly enough it's about the same length as the first movie and hard to tell though because it felt like this one kind of dragged on a few times despite having about the same length and so like I said a lot of people criticize this because the visuals have not aged well and there are certain times where it looks fine but yeah for the most part it can look off I mean there are some skits where the characters can look a little more expressive but then it's like all of a sudden there's a skit where the characters just have really blank stares and yeah the visuals have not aged that well and it just looks a little too glossy in certain areas like um, some things look a little too shiny it feels like the early era of the Xbox 360 when everything had like a really strong gloss and um, when they tried making like these fantasy games with, um, you know, cartoony games but with more realistic lighting, it just looked off. Like a, a game that has a good example of that is Cameo Elements of Power. It's like, well, the environments in that game look kind of cool. The characters looked really off. Um, they had a more simplified design, but then you have like this... Um, more extreme looking lighting and shading reflecting off of them and it just looked off and that's kind of the vibe I got when watching this um like it definitely looks better than a PS2 game but it definitely looks like an early Xbox 360 or PS3 game and not like the good ones though like I'm saying like the ones that look like they've definitely aged <laughs> uh so the first skit is basically just um a feud between Minnie and Daisy, um, where they're competing over an ice skating competition, and so they're trying to make it look like both of them are the bad guy, but I couldn't help but just watch this and say, okay, Daisy was flat out the bad guy in this. She is the, the cause of everything. So, you know, it's basically trying to teach uh, people to put, you know, especially best friends, it's trying to teach them 
um, not to let um, jealousy or competitions get between them, basically. And so, a very predictable skit. They're fighting over to be the better skater, and then in the end, they feel bad about what they did, and then when they team up, that's when their performance is stronger, and yeah, very typical. But, so... But what makes this so frustrating, though, is how... So it starts off, um... Uh, so the announcer, um, is about to announce that Minnie is going to be the first to skate in this competition. So Daisy's a little egotistical and thinks they're about to call her name. But then when they call out Minnie, Daisy embarrasses herself by skating onto the stage. And, uh, so then, like, as she's watching Minnie do a good job, she gets jealous to the point where she tries making her look bad. She skates in the middle of the stage, in the middle of Minnie's performance, and tries, you know, she doesn't wait her turn. It's like she was supposed to perform next, but instead she interrupts and the judges allow it. It's like, if if this were more realistic, they would have disqualified Daisy. But no, they allow her to go on with it because the crowd is entertained. And I don't know. So yeah, they get worse and worse to the point where they keep trying to out-top each other. To the point where Minnie tries doing a drastic stunt while blindfolded. Or should I say bowfolded? I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, she messes up and... Uh, messes up the landing, and they try making it look really bad. It's like, honestly, that doesn't look really bad. It doesn't look like she hurt herself, but they try making it feel so dramatic, and so uh, then Daisy apologizes, and they both say that they've really been acting up, and then, of course, they team up and do better, and yeah. I wouldn't, like, it's not a terrible skit, but it's not that great, but I will say, though, out of all of them, though, this one probably looks better than most of them, though. Was, like, the animation, the lighting, the shading, it works a little better in this one. Because once you get to the next two skits, that's where the animation starts to really go downhill. Um, so the next skit is a Huey, Dewey, and Louie skit. And it's basically where we have to see these jerks um, being big troublemakers again. And acting even worse than they were in the first one. It's uh, So it doesn't look like this one has any continuity with the first movie. Uh, even Donald, um, Donald was criticizing them for not having any manners in Once Upon a Christmas, but now he's, um, arguably ruder than them, <laughs> so, but he still has the nerve to try scolding them when they're not behaving, but, uh, so, anyways, um, so anyway, Scrooge made cookies for everyone for dessert, but Huey, Dewey, and Louie ate all of them. So Scrooge decides to have a word with them, and he wants to warn them that if they don't shape up, they're going to end up on the naughty list like he did. And he reveals how ever since he was a lad, he always wanted bagpipes, but he never got it because he never got on the good list. So the boys are convinced that they're on the naughty list because they look back on some of the stuff they did, and they realize the stuff they've been pulling all year long on Donald Duck is considered naughty. But instead of trying to shape up their ways before Christmas, they figure they're better off just sneaking to the North Pole, um, vandalizing Santa Claus's list, and putting their names on it. So, meanwhile, they cause a lot of ruckus there. They end up, like, messing up the production orders of some of the toys. They cause a huge mess, but they decide to help clean up um, in the process. And, I mean, even after coming face-to-face -face with Santa, um, you know, thinking that they're busted, they manage to basically weasel their way out of it and they still manage to find their way to the list and they're it looks like they're about to put their names on the list but instead they seem to have a change of heart so the following morning it's revealed that um they didn't put their names on the nice list they actually put scrooge's name on the nice list so scrooge finally got his bagpipes and so this feels like a very flawed message though i mean yeah it's heartwarming that they were thinking of someone else other than themselves but really that's considered a good deed because they I forgot to mention they get rewarded for what they did the other night um uh, they actually get presents themselves um they don't get coal at all and so yeah that is a pretty bit of a messed up moral so remember kids if you break into Santa's um workshop at the North Pole and write someone else's name on the list other than your own you'll get rewarded for it yeah I don't know yeah, I know I'm looking a bit too into this, but the fact that they're trying to make this feel so whimsical and heartwarming, and yeah, it feels kind of strange. Like, this was definitely one of the weaker shorts on this, but not the worst. That's the one we're going to go to now. Not only, I think not only does this look the worst, but it's written the worst. But So the next one is the Goofy skit, where unlike in um, Mickey's Once Upon a Christmas, where the Goofy skit was one of the better skits, this is arguably the worst. 
I mean, the animation quality on this looks terrible. There's something about Max, like his face just looks smushed in. It's like his face was flattened by a machine, and he just looks way too skinny in this. And so it's like at first it seems like a cute idea. Okay, Max is going to bring his girlfriend to Christmas, and you're thinking hopefully it's going to be Roxanne because, yeah, a lot of people are still mad that um, they didn't explain what happened to them in an extremely goofy movie. And so then they decide to frustrate fans even more by revealing he has a new girlfriend named... Mona, I think was her name, and it's like, we don't care. It's like, they're trying to make it feel like this is a lovey-dovey couple, but it's like, none of us care. We've never met this character before. They're forcing us to like her, and it's like, we don't care. So, of, it's basically a rehash of a Goofy movie done worse. You know, Max is bringing a girl home to Christmas, and he knows Goofy's gonna embarrass her, and so... Um, but they, this is one of the shortest skits in the movie, luckily, but even then, that doesn't save it from being the worst. And it's mostly a musical montage of a really dumb song, while we see Max constantly getting embarrassed over everything Goofy does for them. And so, of course, um, in um, basically rehashing the ending to a Goofy movie, um, Goofy is, at, well, Max is acting like, um, you know, it's the end of the world, but in the end, he's finding out that his girlfriend is actually, um, warming up to Goofy, and, God, this is also a rehash of a plot from the House of Mouse, an episode where it confirmed that him and Roxanne were still dating, and it did the exact same thing as that episode. Max thinks that everyone, especially Goofy, are gonna embarrass him, but in the end, um, Roxanne had a good time, and they did the same thing with Mona in this, and, but they went even further. They reveal that Mona's a little bit goofy as well, judging by how she has teeth like Goofy and Max. It's like, okay? Just because she has a goofy smile doesn't make everything okay. I don't know. This is just stupid. But I'll say if there's one thing that is kind of funny about this skit, though, it's Goofy's cell phone. That was arguably the best part of this short. But everything about it was so bad. I mean, don't get me started on how bad that popcorn looked. <laughs> This was the last time we ever saw Max, and quite a bummer of a way to kill off a, a once interesting character, <laughs> but it's like after that, it's like he was never seen from again, never heard from again, and... <laughs> now, if Disney were to ever try to bring Max back into some kind of Disney show or something on Disney+, Plus, here's what I think would be a great idea. They should try making, like, Goof Troop the next generation or something like that, and... Like, that's, that's not actually what I'd want it to be called, but imagine this. After Max graduated from college, he eventually got back together with Roxanne, and it's revealed years later they're now married, and they have a newborn child. And so they need to find some place to raise their child, because let's just say some kind of misfortune caused Max's home to be destroyed. And so they have no choice but to move back in with Goofy in Spooner Street. And so, um, there, there could be a lot of interesting conflicts in there. Like, um, you know, they, they should still focus on the, the comedy. That's what Goofy's always known for. But there's a lot of interesting drama they could bring into this. Um, so imagine if, um, you know, they move back into Spooner Street and they find out Pete still lives next door. And you could see, like, Roxanne or Max getting kind of uncertain about living next to him because... Max recalls all the bad things that Pete has done in the past, and, you know, he remembers, like, how growing up as a child, Pete was the worst man ever, and how are they going to feel if raising their own kid? I mean, Goofy was arguably an oblivious dad, so he wasn't aware of all the dangerous stuff or selfish and cruel stuff Pete did to his kid, and it's like, that could, in that could introduce a lot of interesting conflicts. Um, I would love to see them make a series like that, um... You know, have Goofy be a grandfather now, and, um, you know, it's like Max is trying to learn from the mistakes that, um, Goofy made, and, but, um, so it's like there's some that he manages to avoid, and there's some that he just can't help but accidentally duplicate, you know? It's like, no matter how far you try to be, not be like your dad, sometimes you just end up having to be like your dad, or, I don't know, I would love to see that, though. Would anyone else love to see a Goof Troop continuation like that with Max and Roxanne as a couple, I'm trying to raise a son or so. I would love to see how that would turn out. That would be fun and nostalgic. The fourth skit isn't too bad. I'd say the animation, this one's definitely a huge step up from the last one we saw. So it definitely implies that there were possibly some different animation divisions working on these shorts. So, I mean, God, you even look at how Max looks in the very last skit. Like, he reappears in the final skit and 
he looked slightly better in that. Like, I noticed they tried giving him more realistic-looking hair in the last skit, but it just d didn't match well with the rest of his um, model, I guess. And it, it, a part of me wonders, though, what would it be like if they tried doing a project like this nowadays with how much technology and animation has evolved, especially from Disney? I mean, Kingdom Hearts 3 proved that the characters can still work in a, a more detail-looking environment, just... Look at how Donald and Goofy looked in the um, the Pirates of the Caribbean world. How they made Donald look feathery and Goofy look fuzzy. And I thought it looked really good, though. It was an improvement. Um, part of me is like, darn, I wish you could see him looking like that throughout the game. That's how impressed I was with those visuals. And so it makes me wonder, can Disney pull that off? I mean, Looney Tunes pulled it off um, back around, like, uh, the 2010s or whatever. They had some of those theatrical shorts. Um where they recycled audio footage of Mel Blanc, like for Daffy Duck and Tweety, and they showed them like in more feathery looking designs, or some of the characters looking more realistically furry, but they still maintain their cartoony movements and appearances, and it's like, that worked really well. I'd love to see Disney try to pull that off someday, and King March 3 is probably the closest we ever got to that, but anyways, um, so this next skit is basically um, just... A very relatable skit for many, I can imagine, where Donald just wants peace and quiet. And I can definitely imagine this would relate to those who have to work in stores and they're forced to listen to Christmas music all day. And so Donald just wants to sit down with peace and quiet and just drink a nice hot cup of hot cocoa. But, um, you know, he just keeps hearing, um, we wish you a Merry Christmas everywhere he goes, and he's just sick of it. And then, um, you know, his nephews want to go to the mall to see some kind of um, show and he doesn't want to go, but Daisy drags him into it. And so it's kind of funny how everywhere Donald goes, he keeps hearing, we wish you a Merry Christmas. Not, But this time, he's not hearing it vocally. He's hearing it sound effect-wise. Like, whether it's a people um, hammering something onto a board or someone using a cash register or puppies barking, he just keeps hearing that jingle to the point where he stumbles upon the stage show of the mechanical performance that um, the kids are waiting for. And so... So when the curtain opens up, Donald destroyed the set out of anger, and he upsets everyone, and so Donald starts to feel ashamed of himself, but he eventually stumbles upon um, some carolers trying to sing um, We Wish You a Merry Christmas, but they're a bit divisive on how it goes properly, like what tones to use, and so we think it almost looks like Donald is about to, you know, snap at them. It's revealed that... Um, he, he claims he knows the song better than everyone else, so he's trying to help them out and compose it properly. And so he causes the whole town to join in and sing along, and his family forgives him just for that. And so, yeah, it's, like, nothing special, but it's, like, it was harmless, though. It's, like, that was definitely better than the last two skits. And so now we're down to our final skit, which, um, it's not too bad, but, um, it's not really... That's the problem I had with this. Most, despite how this one has more skits than the first one, these were more forgettable than the first ones. And maybe it helps that I just saw the first one as a little kid, but, I mean, I can even compare them to, you know, looking at it as an adult and seeing, like, will this entertain kids? I can definitely say the first one has more entertaining stories. Where, So the final skit is basically, remember the episode of SpongeBob, um, Have You Seen the Snail, where Gary runs away? Well, it's basically the exact same thing, but with um mickey and pluto in the setting of christmas so yeah um pluto is too impatient to set up a christmas tree star while mickey is trying way too hard to over prepare for you know a perfect christmas party with his friends and family but um he pluto gets impatient and tries setting the star up himself and he ends up accidentally knocking the tree over and causing um things to get destroyed and so mickey's a little upset with him and he orders him to go outside. Although Mickey had a right to be upset, he handled it pretty well, though. I've seen Mickey lose his temper much worse than this in older cartoons. Heck, I've even seen him flat-out threaten Pluto before. Like, it, like you'd see him raise his fist like he's about to hit him or something, and it's like, so compared to those, it's like, this was the most tame, you know, reasonable reaction out of Mickey for Pluto. And so this is what causes Pluto to think Mickey doesn't want him anymore and he runs away. I don't know. It felt weak. And heck, they even use this plot many times in other Mickey Mouse cartoons. I remember seeing this like in um 
one of those old Mickey Mouse works or House of Mouse cartoons. There's one where Pluto ran away and um, decided to live with Pete, and he decides that Pete's a worse owner than Mickey, and he goes back to Mickey. So, yeah, this is basically a rehash of that, but with a Christmas setting. But Pluto runs away to the North Pole and gets um, adopted by these two reindeer who could have easily been very annoying characters, and they were tolerable. Um, I think one of them was voiced by Jeff Bennett, and one of them was definitely voiced by Jim Cummings. So Mickey realizes that Pluto is missing. He tries calling Minnie, but she was too busy using a hair dryer. And I, I just love how they have her using her hair dryer on her ears and the way it's flowing back like actual hair. I don't know. That's kind of funny. But Mickey decides um, to try to look for Pluto himself. But um, his car is trapped under a lot of snow, so he can't drive up. So he has to look by foot. Um, there's a running gag where Mickey keeps running into um, a crazed driver just plowing snow all over him and... Uh, so that catches up later on in the episode, and I'll admit that was kind of a funny little, um, you know, way to wrap everything up. But So um, Mickey's still desperately looking for Pluto, but he's about to give up, and so as a desperate resort, he goes to a mall Santa, sits on his lap, and desperately um, wishes for Pluto back. And so um, it's tr it turns out that was actually the real Santa, though. So Santa goes back to the North Pole and sees Pluto with his reindeer, and he... Um, Tells Pluto how his owner misses him very much, and he... So, luckily, Pluto was starting to feel homesick around this time, so he happily wants to go back. Um, so, Santa gives him a ride back, and... But then that crazed driver comes back, and it's revealed it was Goofy. But not just Goofy, though, but um, all of Mickey's friends were there. They decided to pitch in and try to help Pluto, and... Um, it turns out Scrooge was responsible for... He used his money to pay for the snowplow for Goofy to drive, and... Uh, so, um, Mickey then invites everyone in, and his decorations aren't as nice as they were originally, but they're just right enough, you know, everyone still thinks it looks beautiful, and, um, so they all, very similar ending to the first one, everyone gathers around and sings a medley of Christmas songs, and that's it. So, yeah, um, it's not terrible, like, I've heard, I've heard people consider this, like, one of the worst Mickey Mouse related cartoons, and... I wouldn't go that far. I mean, yeah, the visuals have aged really badly. It's nothing special, but it's nothing infuriating. I mean, kids will probably enjoy it. That's what it's meant for. It's meant to entertain kids, and, I mean, there's much more stuff you could show your kids. And This definitely has not aged very well, though. I mean, this is probably more acceptable back around 2004, but I can definitely understand kids who are spoiled by cartoons with such better animation. They can look at this and probably get disgusted by how it looks but for me i grew up in an era where cgi was still very primitive and it was still constantly being worked on so at the time this was pretty good looking there were not enough cartoons that looked like this but nowadays it's like ugh, um <laughs> thank goodness they got better because back then uh you know it was um amazing to see stuff look like this but we've been so spoiled by such better technology and better animations that it does kind of tamper with this. I mean, I had more fun looking for screenshots of the first one. Uh, Mickey's Once Upon a Christmas was hand-drawn, and while it doesn't have the best animation quality, I mean, there are definitely better, even straight-to-video movies, there were much better-looking animation, like, uh, The Three Musketeers, that arguably looked better than this. The animation was more fluid, more wacky, an extremely goofy movie was another good example, but, so this, there are times where the characters can have pretty derpy looking expressions um it can look a little uneven but there was more to pick out of it there actually were a few like funny facial expressions that you could find just by pausing the video and i couldn't really get much of that in twice upon a christmas the facial expressions were lacking in this one and at least they were trying in certain areas though i mean it, it was definitely better than some other computer animated shows around the time but um yeah, I feel like they could do so much better. I wouldn't mind... Like, I still think it looks better than Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. I mean, that just looks so dull. I, at least this one tried giving it a little lighting and shading to give it more detail. Where Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, not only is it geared towards brain-dead preschoolers, but it's like there's just no detail to it. There's, like, no, barely any shading, really no lighting. It just looks so fake. And, I mean, yeah, the argument here is everyone looks too plastic, but at least... It, 
have some kind of visual. Something about it stands out, you know. I don't know. I just not a huge fan of those preschooler Mickey Mouse shows and I hate how that's all they use CGI for Mickey Mouse anymore. They always have to make it be a preschooler show. It's like why can't they try making um you know it doesn't have to be computer animated, but why can't they make Mickey Mouse cartoons where they use the designs that you see in like um uh, Mickey's Once Upon a Christmas, but with more detail and more fluid animation. Why do they have to look so crude nowadays? I don't know, but I'm sorry. I know I, I hate how I have to bring that up every time I talk about Mickey Mouse. I mean, uh, I just ranted about it on a review I did for um, Castle of Illusion the other night, and it's like, oh, I'm doing it again. So I apologize for that, but... Um, but yeah, um, if, if you have kids or, um, know anyone in your family who has kids and you want to show them some, you know, Christmas movies that maybe teach them a few lessons or entertain them, then yeah, Mickey's Once Upon a Christmas and Twice Upon a Christmas aren't bad choices, but so like if you're running out of time, though, like if you're over for a visit and you can only show them one movie, uh, it's like, I would definitely pick Mickey's Once Upon a Christmas over Twice Upon a Christmas, but... Um, well, uh, that's all I have to say for now. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and have a great day.